Hello everyone, welcome to another video. I'm Randy, and this is another in my series where I go through each year and tell you my favorite album, my favorite song, my favorite movie, and my favorite television show from each year. We're up to 1968. I started in 1950. Uh, this might be the last before till, until after the holidays as things get kind of hectic. And maybe I'll try to do vinyl finds maybe or a couple thread videos, but I'll try to pick this series back up at the first of the year. And anyway, we're in 1968. I also want to preface things by saying that I actually have to have a physical copy of whatever I'm picking. And also for the TV series, they are only eligible their debut season. This year was a little different, but we'll get to that when we get to the TV series. And let's get started in 1968. All right, for my favorite album from 1968, the fourth runner up, Fleetwood Mac. Self-titled. On the Blue Horizon. Uh, this was a reissue. But anyway, uh, this is their debut LP when they were a British blues band uh, led by Peter Green's Guitar Mastery and with songs written by Jeremy Spencer, Green, and a couple of good covers and Howlin' Wolf's No Place to Go and Elmore James' Shaker Mounting Maker. Just a great English blues album. My third runner-up is Child is the Father to the Man by Blood, Sweat, and Tears. The back cover, they were on the Columbia label. Now, this is my favorite uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears album uh, with Al Cooper leading the group uh, before David Clayton Thomas was brought in as lead vocalist. With Al Cooper leaving, well, I guess being asked to leave after the debut album, uh, Al Cooper wanted a rock band with a horn section, which they, they kind of stayed like that. But uh, some great Cooper songs like I Can't Quit Her and I Love You More Than You'll Ever Know. It's a shame they couldn't keep it together with uh, Al Cooper leading the group because that's my favorite. This is their debut. My second runner-up is Beggar's Banquet by the Rolling Stones. On the Decca label. Uh... This is the seventh studio album and the first produced by Jimmy Miller, who produced what many consider their best albums in quite a run. Uh, they returned to a more rootsy feel with the classic Sympathy for the Devil, showing how innovative they could be, and other great songs like No Expectations, Street Fighting Man, and Jigsaw Puzzle. They also kind of had a more country blues feeling to some of the songs. Rolling Stones, Beggar's Banquet. My first runner-up is Music from Big Pink by The Band. Now, uh, this, this is the debut album from The Band uh, with Big Pink referring to the house in upstate New York where most of the music was written. There's a picture of the house on the back. Uh, they had previously been backing Bob Dylan as the Hawks. Uh, this cover is a Dylan painting, and uh, there's just so many great songs like The Way to Everyone Covered, and there's a great uh, example of that on the last waltz where they had the staple singers singing along with them on the wait. But just a great tune. I still prefer the band's version the most. Uh, also, some a great rocker, uh, Chess Fever is on here. This Wheels on Fire, Tears of Rage, and Dylan's I Shall Be Released. Just a great debut album by the band. My favorite album from 1968. Anyone that really knows me knows what it's going to be. And yes, it's Astro Weeks from Van Morrison. On the Warner Brothers label. This is my favorite album of all time, and just a masterpiece of jazz-influenced Celtic rock. The highlight is the bass, one of the highlights is the bass playing by jazz musician Richard Davis, uh, which Rolling Stone writer 
Grio Marcus said was the best bass playing on any rock record. Uh, it's just, it was a real departure from his debut and a landmark and a melding of genres. Oops, almost got the, my favorite album of all time and I think the best album of 1968. Now for my favorite song of 1968, the fourth runner up from Otis Redding. This is a hits collection. Um, on side two, you can see it sitting on the dock of the bay. Uh, recorded three days before Otis Redding died in a plane crash. It signals Redding's willingness to experiment with other genres to make a pop masterpiece. Uh, it would have been interesting to see what other directions his music would have taken if not for his unfortunate death. Love the whistling on it too. Just Otis Redding sitting on the dock of the bay. I also want to say that I will put links below to a track from each of the albums I pick and the songs I pick as well. Uh, so let's get down to uh, my third runner-up. It's from R Randy Newman's debut, just self-titled, and it's the song, I Think It's Going to Rain Today. And it's on the Reprise label. But yep, nobody's better with an understated lyric than Randy Newman with a song that seems to celebrate the futility of things. And I think it's going to rain today. Uh, also love the simple piano playing to the and the beautiful orchestration. This Randy Newman, who was fantastic. My second runner up is All Along the Watchtower from the Jimi Hendrix Experience. You can see that's the next to the last song on the second, out, second uh, record on here. Yeah, this is Electric Ladyland, fantastic album, uh, probably the best Dylan cover ever, a song that Jimmy, Jimmy makes his own, uh, eschewing the folk constructs and making it a blues searing rock classic. It also has some great Hendrix guitar solos in it, yeah. All Along the Watchtower, Jimi Hendrix. And my first runner-up is from Beggar's Banquet. It's Sympathy for the Devil, which is actually with all the graffiti. Uh, you can see <laughs> there's the songs. Sympathy for the Devil. Uh, the, all the songs are written in here within the graffiti anyway. But yeah, only the Rolling Stones could have a song sung from the devil's point of view. In the song, uh, The Devil Points Out the Atrocities of Man. It has been referred to as a rocking samba, which is a pretty good description of the soulful but foreboding backup singers. Just an all-time classic. Uh, of course, this is the alternative. Or this is, this is the, I think, the original cover, and then they did have an alternative cover. But I got, this, this is a re, mono reissue, and I went to the original cover. And my favorite song for 1968, indeed, comes from Astro Weeks, Van Morrison. It's the song, it? Madam George. Uh, it's my favorite Van Morrison song as well. And his ultimate free association, stream of consciousness lyrics mixed with folk, blues, jazz, and rock. Morrison has said that it's about several characters combined into one, and many have postulated that it's about leaving your past behind. It's quite a cosmic journey. Uh, I'd call it a masterpiece. And it's Madame George from Astral Weeks. After my favorite movie of 1968, the fourth runner-up is Bullet, directed by Peter Yates. This is a two-disc special edition, which has two documentaries on the second disc. It was in this Steve McQueen collection box set. But yeah, of course, this contains one of the best car chase scenes through the streets of San Francisco. Uh, Steve McQueen in his iconic role as Detective Frank Bullitt, a nonconformist cop. It also stars his green 1968 Ford Mustang GT. Uh, and also, uh, Steve McQueen did some of the uh, 
stunt driving in the, the movie. Uh, just a fantastic uh, action thriller, Steve McQueen and the bull in the bullet. bullet. <laughs> My third runner up, 2001, A Space Odyssey, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Uh, this is probably the most acclaimed film on my list, a landmark film that took science fiction films to a new plateau. Of course, I'm talking about my favorite films and not necessarily what I consider the best, and there's three other films that I enjoy more. Uh, this film can leave me a little cold sometimes, but it was a unique experience that had you questioning your place in the universe. Just fantastic film. I just like three others a little bit more. My second runner-up is Rosemary's Baby. This is a Criterion collection, which has some great extras on it. Uh, Mia Farrow and John Cassavetes move into a posh old New York apartment building, which is the Dakota, uh, where they are some strange, where there are some strange goings on in the building, uh, especially with their omnipresent neighbors, played by Ruth Gordon and Sidney Blackmer. Uh, Mia Farrow, as the pregnant mother, is fantastic, and it was a huge snub that she didn't get even nominated, let alone win, uh, although uh, Ruth Gordon did win for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, it's, it's a horror masterpiece, which you don't find that often. Rosemary's Baby. My first runner-up is Planet of the Apes, directed by Franklin Schaefer, who also directed Patton with George C. Scott. This came in a box set of those early Planet of the Apes movies. Uh, this movie made quite an impression on me as a kid, as I was just as surprised as Charlton Heston and his fellow crew members were to find a world run by apes. Of course, it isn't that surprising now with all the Planet of the Apes reboots, uh, but the new ones seem to lack the sense of wonder that the original conveyed. Uh, I, love, I love this movie, the original especially. Planet of the Apes. My favorite movie from 1968 is Once Upon a Time in the West, directed by Sergio Leone. This is a two-disc set. <laughs> Another one with some great extras. Uh, I think that he's now won two of the last three years. But uh, this film makes a tremendous use of the widescreen, the great expanses and extreme close-ups. It's not made for those with short attention spans, especially the beginning of the film. But it's a movie that demands your attention and your patience, and it pays off with big rewards, I think. It includes a great opening scene with Charles Bronson's arrival and sub subsequent confrontation. Just a masterpiece of cinema in my eyes. Once Upon a Time in the West for a 1968 movie. And now for my favorite television show from 1968. This year I only found four that I thought would qualify, at least for me. And let's get to it. My third runner-up is the TV show Here Come the Brides. As a young kid, I had a crush on Bridget Hanley there while the girls were crushing on Bobby Sherman there. Uh, in this, a logging company boss promises to bring 100 women to keep his lumberjack operation going. That would be Robert Brown there. It was loosely based on the movie Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, which was inspired by actual historical events of bringing women from the East Coast to Seattle. Also starred Joan Blondell and David Soule before Stars Again Hutch. Yeah, Seven Brides, or Seven Brides. Here come the brides. My second runner-up is Land of the Giants. It came kind of in this, which was around this cool wooden case where it looks like they're all in prison there. And you would open it up like that. And then the DVDs were in here. But yeah, really cool set. But Land of the Giants. Uh, it was a fun science fiction series where the protagonists crash and land on a planet where everything is 12 times their size, with the inhabitants referred to as giants by the crew. The special effects were pretty amazing for that time period, and they had some many of these giant-sized props to show off the crew's small size. Jeff Conway uh, was the star who had been in Burke's Law, 
And the music was composed by John Williams, who would later go on to provide music for Star Wars. Great series from Irwin Allen, Land of the Giants. My uh, first runner-up for my favorite television series for 1968 is Hawaii Five-0. Yeah, the original. I, I actually haven't seen the new one, so I don't know much about it, so I can't say anything. But this is a long-running police drama set in Hawaii starring Jack Lord as Captain Steve McGarrett, head of a special task force. The popular phrase, book em Dano, came from this series, and that was Danny Williams, as was Dano, played by James MacArthur. But uh, it also had one of the best intro segments with the theme music composed by Morton Stevens. A cover version of the venture, a cover version by the Ventures would become a big hit for them. When it wrapped up production, it was the longest running police procedural, but has since been surpassed. Yeah, the original Hawaii Five O. And now for my favorite television series from 1968. This was where the ambiguity was uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, and that this. A series didn't really become a regular running part of the network programming until 1971, but two uh, pilot episodes were released in 1968, so that's where I'm counting it, and that's Columbo. Uh, Columbo was a police homicide detective played by Peter Falk, and it was unique in that there was no, huge, no whodunit to most of the episodes, as you already know who the killer was. It was just the fun was finding out how Columbo was going to trick the suspect into giving himself up. Uh, and also he would be an irritant with his uh, many questions and keep arriving, especially when he would go, uh, just one more thing or one last question before he would leave. But uh, it was part of the mystery movie series that uh, rotated different shows, starting on NBC and later moving to ABC. Now, this is actually the fifth season, and I just rewatched one of the episodes, which is The Last Salute to the Commodore, which was actually one where there was a who done it because you didn't know who did it at the beginning, although you thought you did. But uh, ordinarily, like I said, there's no who done it to it. Uh, but this was just a unique a series. You know, you had uh, Columbo and his rumpled trench coat, cigar. And the unseen wife, he would also he would often mention, although there was a later Mrs. Columbo spinoff, but it did only lasted thirteen episodes. Yeah, Columbo, my favorite television series from nineteen sixty eight, and that does it. I'll see you in nineteen sixty nine when I get around to it. it. Might be at the first of the year, but please let list uh, your favorites on there. So I, I always love seeing you who who you pick, and maybe it's a show I haven't seen or a movie I haven't seen, an album I need to check out. But everyone, take care. Thanks for watching and have a good holiday.